I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly, funding the war effort. President Joe Biden uses his primetime address to discuss the wars in Israel and Ukraine. Clashes on campus. Lawmakers are taking a closer look at pro-Palestinian protests. Threat from China. Beijing blasts a new report from the U.S. military. They believe that their lives have been spared for a special purpose, which was to work together to defeat atheistic Soviet communism. We honor beloved Saint Pope John Paul II and his fight for democracy. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Paul of the Cross. We begin tonight in the Middle East and with a sliver of hope. A mother and daughter held hostage by Hamas were released earlier today by the terrorist group. An Israeli Defense Forces official confirms the pair are now in the care of the IDF. Judith Ty Rainin and her 17-year-old daughter Natalie were visiting a family in a kibbutz that was attacked two weeks ago. Hamas says that they released them for humanitarian reasons due to the mother's poor health. In a statement, President Joe Biden said that he was overjoyed by the release, adding, from the earliest moments of this attack, we have been working around the clock to free American citizens who were taken hostage by Hamas, and we have not ceased our efforts to secure the release of those who are still being held. But those release efforts are made more complicated by the widely anticipated massive offensive by Israel and the current fighting on the ground and strikes from the air. Following what Tel Aviv called a military operation, the Israeli army has withdrawn from the Nur Shams refugee camp in the occupied West Bank. In a statement, the Palestinian health ministry reported 13 people were killed during the offensive, including five children. In Gaza, residents of the Al Sahar neighborhood assessed the damage after Israel launched a series of missile strikes. Buildings, towers and homes have been reduced to rubble. Residents said they received warning messages from Israel prior to the strikes. The Israeli military has also confirmed an airstrike hit the grounds of the historic St. Porphyus Greek Orthodox Church in Gaza City. They said it happened while they were targeting a Hamas command center nearby. According to the charity group Aid to the Church in Need, at least 16 Christians, including 10 from one family, were killed. Many others are now trapped in the rubble. Around 400 people, mostly Christians, have been sheltering in the compound since the start of the armed conflict. Our President Joe Biden calls on U.S. lawmakers to approve spending billions of dollars to help Israel and Ukraine. It is part of a supplemental funding proposal. The White House says the money will support Israel's defense against terrorism and defend Ukraine against Russian aggression. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. So in. Tracy, the supplemental request includes $61 billion for Ukraine, $14 billion for Israel, $9 billion for humanitarian assistance. And last night, President Joe Biden, in a speech from the Oval Office, told the nation, quote, making sure Israel and Ukraine succeed is vital for America's national security. With war raging in multiple parts of the globe, Israel fighting Hamas terrorists, and Ukraine battling back against Russia's invasion, President Joe Biden tells the nation. You know, history has taught us that when terrorists don't pay a price for their terror, when dictators don't pay a price for their aggression, they cause more chaos and death and more destruction. They keep going. And the cost and the threats to America and the world keep rising. And today, the White House Office of Management and Budget writes in a letter to the House of Representatives, this supplemental request invests over $50 billion in the American defense industrial base, ensuring our military continues to be the most ready, capable, and best equipped fighting force the world has ever seen. Also today, the president welcomes to the White House European Council President Charles Michel and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. Madam President, Mr. President, uh, it's great to see you both again. President Biden trying to assure EU leaders the U.S. will come through with wartime aid for Ukraine and Israel, despite the current upheaval in Congress. The president also said he got a commitment from Israel and Egypt that a crossing will soon be open to allow aid into Gaza. The highway had to be repaved because it was very, very bad shape. And I believe that within the next 24 to 48 hours, the first 20 trucks will come across with aid. 
Meanwhile, GOP presidential candidate Nikki Haley blames the world's current troubles on the current occupant of the Oval Office, posting on X. The shame of it all is that we wouldn't be in this terrible position if Joe Biden hadn't been so weak in Afghanistan, so slow in Ukraine, so pandering to Iran, and so absent from the border. The world is on fire, and America needs strong new leadership to deal with it. Add it all up, and the White House is asking for $105 billion in supplemental funding. Also included in that total, additional Border Patrol agents and asylum officers on the U.S. southern border, countering fentanyl, as well as money for Indo-Pacific security. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. The U.S. House tried and failed to elect a new speaker. Republican Congressman Jim Jordan lost a third vote, and this time by an even larger margin, with 25 GOP colleagues voting against him. Democrats say Republicans are in a disarray. It's time for House Republicans to embrace bipartisanship and abandon extremism once and for all. That is your only way out of the House Republican chaos and dysfunction. Last well, the House GOP caucus met behind closed doors uh, for over an hour and decided to oust Congressman Jordan right as speaker-elect by a secret ballot. The conference plans to hold a candidate forum Monday night. Like today, former Speaker Kevin McCarthy uh, now endorsed current Majority Whip Congressman Tom Emmer to become speaker. Bottom line, the House yeah. remains at a standstill with no end in sight. All protests both for and against Israel have taken place on college campuses across the U.S. at several universities. Students, professors, and administrators have condemned Israel's attack on Palestinians in Gaza. Lawmakers and others are asking why so many young people are pointing fingers at Israel, even accusing them of war crimes. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with more. Eric? Well, good evening, Tracy. Emotions are certainly running high on college campuses across the country. The nation hasn't seen these kinds of demonstrations or calls to action since the war protests during the Vietnam War in the 1960s. Some experts say that college students are being brainwashed by their professors to hate Jews. This is a natural outgrowth of a radical ideology that's being promoted on campus, uh, critical race theory. Jews inevitably get placed in the oppressor category in these schemes. And uh, so there is a strong anti-Semitic element in this ideology that's being promoted on campus. Many lawmakers agree. It's disgusting. The protests you're seeing now at many of our universities, you see the 31 groups from Harvard, for example, they're standing in solidarity with the Palestinians. It's 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 a, the, probably the clearest example yet of the moral, moral depravity in our university system. The killing of innocent children, the beheading of infants, the raping of women is somehow justified. That's what you're seeing. And I, I look at that and I, I don't even know what to say. In his 40 years in higher education, Senator Tommy Tuberville, a former university football coach, tells me anti-Semitic teachers are influencing kids and young adults. I've seen indoctrination of our kids in the high school level, uh, now even down in the grade school level, and especially in higher education, in the colleges. Uh, a lot of these professors are whack jobs. You know, they're communist. So what can be done? Congressman Larry Bouchon of Indiana tells me it starts at home. Well, you do what I did with my four kids, right? You sit down around the kitchen table, have dinner together, and talk about what's going on in their world and in their lives. And that's how this, this works. Parents should be engaged. We always were with our kids. The protests are beginning to affect the financial bottom line for some colleges and universities as wealthy donors have pledged to stop giving. I actually think this will be very effective at beginning to roll back um, uh, radical ideologies on campus. Just yesterday, Democratic Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland brought a resolution by Republican Josh Hawley condemning anti-Semitic speech on college campuses. Senator Van Hollen said that the resolution would, quote, smear all of the students who engage in these types of protests, potentially violating their First Amendment rights. Tracy. Well, Eric, uh, I understand the newest senator uh, is not running for re-election next year. Tell us more about that. That's right. Uh, California Democrat uh, LaFonza Butler, who was appointed to fill the seat by uh, 
the passing of the late Senator Dianne Feinstein will not be seeking re-election in November. Senator Butler was sworn in earlier this month and made history as the first out black lesbian to enter Congress. Tracy. Okay, thank you, Eric. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including from one side of the spectrum to another, a sign of hope. A Catholic university extends a hand of friendship by providing a safe haven for Jewish students. And why the Orthodox Church is under threat in Ukraine. As we just heard, one of the byproducts of the war between Israel and Hamas is a rise of anti-Semitism on college campuses. One Catholic school in Ohio is doing what it can to combat anti-Semitism, opening its doors via an expedited transfer process to Jewish students seeking a safe haven. And joining us now to talk about the initiative is Father Dave Pavanka, the president of Franciscan University of Steubenville. Father Dave, great to have you back on. Um, you know, a lot to get to, but first, I'm curious, why do you think that we are seeing this rise in anti-Semitism and in institutions of higher learning now? I mean, it is the one place where you would think uh, civil discourse and tolerance will be commonplace. Uh, yeah. Well, first off, it's it's always good to be with you. Yeah, you would think that, wouldn't you? Um, but my experience has been oftentimes this idea of tolerance is tolerance as long as you think or believe the way we believe. But if you are in it all different, um, they're not tolerant. And, and it's just honestly, maybe in some ways this is showing a true color is that tragically we have a history of anti-Semitism and I don't know why it is. There was just actually a, a Jewish student in Pittsburgh who wrote an article for, in the Pittsburgh newspaper, and he said it's, it's situations like this that the, the crazies come out. And it just, it seems, it's so incongruent with, with our faith and the fact that we might be able to do something to help somebody. I, I just felt that this was the path we had to take. Yeah, it really is important, Father Dave. And can you walk us through um, you know, the decision to offer this yeah. transfer opportunity to Jewish students that are facing, you know, this persecution. I, I would love to. I mean, there, there's actually a little bit of a backstory to it. Um, when Hamas did the, the attack against the people of Israel, um, I get a call later that day, and we have 38 students from Franciscan University that were in Israel. And you can imagine as a president, I mean, <laughs> those are my kids, they're my students. And there was about 48 hours of, of anxiety and prayer. And we just worked, thank the Lord, we were able to get them out. We got them out through Jordan. But what president doesn't have a heart for his students to make sure that they're safe? Well, I think you're aware that we'll be offering a conference on campus next week. So literally starting in four days on Jewish Christian dialogue. And one of the individuals on that committee reached out to us and they said, are you aware what's going on in so many colleges and campuses right now? The anti-Semitism and, and the riots and the hate speech and just horrible things that are being done. And he said, the reality is there's a population of students who simply don't feel safe. And we, we got together, honestly, as a, as a faculty and staff and administration, several of us, and we prayed and we said, well, Maybe we could offer a safe place for them, a haven for them. Um, your producer, I believe it was at the very beginning, said um, they need a friend right now. I mean, our brothers and sisters are suffering. And they're if, if we could do something that allows them to come to a place, uh, study online or actually come to Steubenville, why wouldn't we open our door for them? Why wouldn't we help protect them? And that's just it's, it's honestly, Tracy, it's not that complicated. That's just what we decided we needed to do. Yeah, it's so wonderful. Hey, Father Dave, I'm curious, you know, how much initial interest have you had in this program so far? And what's been the larger reaction uh, from both faith communities? Yeah, it's it's the, the reaction has been really beautiful. Uh, we've had uh, Jewish brothers and sisters that have reached out and they've thanked us. Uh, some of the media has thanked us. Uh, my alumni are, are overwhelmingly supportive, and they think this is a great idea. The reality is, is we've not actually had a student reach out to us. And, and my thought was, we just wanted to let them know the door's open. Whether or not they want to walk through it, whether or not they want to come, that's between them, their family, their, the school they're at. But we just wanted people to know that that offer was there. 
Yeah, and I know it's going to, like, logistically a little bit hard to do this, um, but you're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Um, can you talk about some of the challenges, though, and how you're going to make this all happen? Yeah, and, and again, you boiled it down perfectly. Yes, there's some logistic issues. I mean, by the grace of God, we've got our largest class ever. We've got our largest returning student body ever. So we're going to have to figure out if they wanted to come on campus, uh, where we might be able to house them and, and how we if they come with dietary restrictions and how we're going to be able to serve and care for that student. But we, we, we don't we're very clear. We don't have all the answers and exactly understand. We just felt that there was something that needed to be done. It needed to be done immediately and let somebody know that if there's nowhere else to go, you have a place to come here. Well, Father Dave, thank you for speaking with us about this initiative. Thank you for what you're doing, and God bless you. Thank you so much. Our lawmakers in Ukraine have moved one step closer to banning the Ukrainian Orthodox Church over its possible ties to Moscow. За 267 рішення прийнято по фракціях, покажіть, будь ласка. A lawmakers overwhelmingly advance the measure. Ukrainian Orthodox leaders say their church is fully independent. Another round of voting is needed to send the bill to the president's desk. China says a recent report compiled by the Pentagon is, quote, full of bias. Beijing officials say the report on China's nuclear buildup ignores facts. The Pentagon says the communist country is building its nuclear arsenal exceedingly quickly. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, angels unawares. Migrants from around the world gather at the Vatican in search of healing. Plus... It was something that he not only taught theologically, but that, that he lived personally. We dive deep into the works of St. Pope John Paul II ahead of his feast day. A Sunday is the feast of St. John Paul II, and a new museum is honoring his life and legacy. The Memory and Identity Museum is in the saint's native Poland. John Paul II was elected to the papacy back in 1978. He was the first non-Italian pope in 455 years. He is credited with helping to bring an end to communism in Eastern Europe. In his inaugural address as pope on October 22, 1978, he uttered his famous phrase, do not be afraid. We recently spoke with the author of a well-known book on the Polish saint. For more on the life and legacy of St. John Paul II, we turn to Dr. Paul Kengor, professor at Grove City College and author of A Pope and a President, John Paul II, Ronald Reagan, and the extraordinary untold story of the 20th century. Paul, great to have you back. Thanks so much for coming on the Thanks, show. Uh, first off, in what ways, tell us um, how St. John Paul II remains relevant today, not only in his native Poland, uh, and perhaps for the Catholic Church as well. Well, I'd say it's that gospel of life, right, which continues to endure. And it was something that he not only taught theologically, but that, that he lived personally, Tracy. In fact, um, I, I often point to three pivot points in his life. April 20, April 1929, when he lost his mother at a very young age. So he was in his late teens at that point. And his father took him to see Our Lady of Czestochowa in Poland and said, and said, this is now your mother, right? This is now your mother, the Blessed Mother. And then another moment was February 1941 when he lost his father. And, uh, and at that point, he had lost his mother, his only brother, and his father. And, and he wept. He said, he said, I'm all alone now in the world. I'm all alone. And it was then that he went into the church. <laughs> he became a priest. He became a shepherd. So he ended up with spiritual children of his own. And I'd say the other pivot point was May 13th, 1981, when he survived an assassination attempt on our feast day of, of Our Lady of Fatima, right? And, and in fact, he would later say one hand shot the bullet and another hand deflected the bullet. I want to touch on this. Uh, we reported earlier uh, this week that in last weekend's election in Poland, the former Communist Party received a lot of support from young voters. Uh, what is a signal for the future of John Paul II's home country and perhaps a rise in communism elsewhere? 
Yeah, it's a shame. And really, it's the kind of thing that we're seeing all over the world, and including in America. We don't exactly have communists that are being elected, but groups like the Democratic Socialists of America, which is the party of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, um, Ilhan Omar, a number of other people in Congress. And John Paul II would have probably been the first to say that this, unfortunately, is where a lot of youth go. And it's one of the reasons why he believes so much in teaching the youth, because he understood that, you know, truly, it's not just a cliche, right? The youth are the future. And, and so he wasn't surprised when young people made uninformed decisions like this based on a lack of experience. So, I mean, only people born, you know, after the fall of the Berlin Wall in Poland could be so, so ignorant and foolish as to vote for communists. Paul, can you also tell us more about his relationship uh, with then-President Ronald Reagan? And do you think that we will ever see a U.S. politician work so closely with the Vatican again? I don't think we will. I mean, I guess I should probably never say never, right? But you, there is no similar relationship right now between President Biden and Pope Francis, or prior to that, Donald Trump and Pope Francis. They might get along, but but there's there's no kind of— there's no, they're not simpatico, right, in the way that John Paul II and Reagan were. And in fact, I mentioned John Paul II being shot on the feast day of Our Lady of Fatima, May 13, 1981. Just six weeks before that, Ronald Reagan was shot, March 30th, 1981. And Reagan immediately, when John Paul II was shot, wrote up, sent off a telegram, a letter, saying, um, I'm somebody who can personally painfully understand exactly what you went through. And when the two of them got together at the Vatican in June 1982, they said to one another that they believed that their lives had been spared for a special purpose, which was to work together to defeat atheistic Soviet communism. So they had a, 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 a personal bond that it's hard to imagine, you know, beyond the other bonds um, a pope and a president ever having again. Uh, that seems kind of um, irreplaceable. And we're going to leave it right there. Beautifully said. As always, such a pleasure to talk to you, Dr. Paul Kangor. We appreciate it. God bless. Thanks, Tracy. Same to you. Well, the Synod on Synodality is in the home stretch. Participants are making their way through the final part of the working document. There have also been prayer events and time with Pope Francis. EWTN Vatican News correspondent Colin Flynn has more. As Synod participants worked on the final phase of this year's gathering, and my laws that I have today's morning session opened with music, a gospel reading, and a message from Pope Francis. Under the watchful gaze of a life-size bronze sculpture of migrants and refugees on a boat, Pope Francis presided over a prayer vigil Thursday night to remember those, just like the people depicted in the monument behind him, who are suffering, emphasizing a call to save and help heal their wounds. The event was organized by the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. Refugees from Cameroon, Ukraine and El Salvador all attended. Cardinal Michael Cherney commissioned the sculpture, Angels Unaware, in 2016 by the artist Timothy Schmaltz. The Canadian Cardinal is also taking part in the Synod. He hopes the participants will not forget the plight of migrants. The Assembly, which is uh, learning how uh, to walk together uh, as a church, uh, will effectively symbolize walking together with uh, the, some of the most vulnerable people on our planet, namely the, those who are fleeing, um, those who are forced to be on the move, uh, those whom we call migrants and refugees. Many Catholics, especially in the U.S., are worried that the Synod has a predetermined outcome with a progressive agenda to change church teaching and governance. Yes, we live in a very suspicious age. I think we breathe this That age. concern was presented to Bishop Daniel Flores of Brownsville, Texas. Here's how he responded. I have no worry about that. I do not see a conspiracy. I have simply heard honest, sincere, faithful charitable conversations under, shall I say, under um, sub tutela petri, under the, the care of Peter. Um, 
that is not a threat to the faith. During the Synod, there has been a lot of talk about the Instrumentum Laboris, or the working document for the Synod. Cardinal Louis Rafael Seco, Patriarch of Baghdad, explained to EWTN News its meaning and intention. It went very well, so there is an awareness on the part of all of us to be servants, to bring the gospel, to have the courage to speak about God, about Christ, in a very humble way, but also as a family. We all have to work together and not separate, so this concept of authority has to be fatherly. And it's also about closeness, support. From the Americas to Africa, this assembly is a global representation of the church. Uh, the B3 is more about administration. Bishop Donatus Aimeo Sion Ugon is head of the Diocese of Uromai, Nigeria. He spoke to EWTN News about the concluding stages of the Synod next week, when the final document will be produced. Well, the document that will come out next week is still work in progress. It will still be sent to the other churches. So nobody knows exactly the final statement, but when it comes out, I believe in the next one year, there will still be a lot of work done on the document that will come out. As the last week of the Synod approaches, Pope Francis is encouraging people of different Christian denominations and other religions to hold a day of prayer, fasting and penance for peace on Friday, October 27th. At the Synod in Rome, Colum Flynn, EWTN News Nightly. And a reminder that starting Monday, EWTN will provide live coverage from the Synod on Synodality. The 45-minute broadcast from the Vatican starts at 5 p.m. Eastern. It will feature news analysis plus exclusive interviews with church leaders and Synod participants. So don't miss it. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.